Hello, and welcome to Discussions with the Director. My name is Celeste Overton Morris, and I am the Chief Program Officer at the Central Susquehanna Intermediate Unit, and also serve as Director at the Center for Schools and Communities. These discussions give me the opportunity to share with you how our core values connect with our work here at the Center. Our core values include service to others, equity in action, passion for excellence, and innovation for growth. Each month, I sit down with a professional who exemplifies one or more of our core values. I hope you enjoy today's interview. Welcome to Discussions with the Director. My name is Dr. Celeste Overton Morris, and today we are speaking with Dr. Danielle Hachimonji and Zumana Noor from the Nemours Children's Health System in Wilmington, Delaware. Welcome to Discussions with the Director. It's a pleasure to have you both here with us today. Thank you for having us. Thank you. We are uh, at the 2024 National Social Emotional Learning Conference sponsored by the Center for the Promotion of Social Emotional Learning, which sits at the Center for Schools and Communities um, here at King of Prussia. And so glad that the two of you are presenting a workshop today. And we are just very interested in learning more about your work and about the study that you conducted or the multiple studies that you've been able to conduct. Um, can you tell us a little bit about those studies and what you've learned? Sure. Uh, so today we're presenting from our work uh, from a project that's called Actions Against Racism. And this is a project that involves a lot of collaborators. I'm in the position of the research director in Actions Against Racism. And our uh, collaborator, Kira Branch, who is not here in this interview, but will be presenting with us later today, uh, is the clinical director and lead intervention developer uh, for this project. And so what we have done is we have piloted uh, educator trainings that build educator skills for taking actions against racism and being able to have constructive dialogues about race and racism in the classroom. Mm -hmm. And so we've done uh, one pilot where we did eight trainings with educators monthly, and they were about 75 to 90 minutes, and they focus on five different actions against racism. So our the name of our project is actually very important because um, the action part we really like to center because we don't want it just to be talking about racism. We want to be taking action to disrupt racism in our school systems. And the idea that it's actions plural is also actually incredibly important because it's not just one action. It can be big or small actions, but everything we do has the potential to really disrupt and, and change this status quo of racism in our school systems. Um, and so in Actions Against Racism, we talk about five different actions. And so that's talking about racism, recognizing racism, disrupting racism, coping with racism, and then healing and repairing harm from racism. And together, we really believe that if we can build those skills for those actions in educators, that they will be able to build those skills in students. And then we're really going to be able to make a difference in kind of changing uh, how our schools operate. Thank you for that. Can you tell us what were the key findings? I know you've done multiple uh, versions of the study all coming together to culminate in these um, really great, I think, lessons and uh, skills that folks will be able to apply moving forward. But can you tell us about those key findings and what they were? Sure. I would say from our uh, pilot um, intervention year, we really learned kind of two things, that there are a lot of folks, a lot of educators that want to do this, that want to take that step, that want to have these courageous conversations, lean into the natural kind of discomfort of this process and do better by our students. There are a lot of, lot of people in, in that kind of camp. We also found that there are a few folks that are just so, um, that the barrier of their discomfort in, in, the, in these conversations is so high that, that they're not ready to engage or they're not quite willing at this point. And so for us, a, a, a challenge is to navigate the, that kind of duality and to figure out how we can get whole school systems to do what they need to do for our black and brown children to make the schools an inclusive space, to make them a space where kids can grow and learn and, and heal and, and, and cope if needed with, with racialized stress and trauma, but ultimately really thrive. Can you tell us how you came to those five areas and what the thought behind them was? Absolutely. So those five actions against racism came about 
um, from bringing together social and emotional learning, uh, trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy, and the idea of racial socialization. And so these are all kind of um, areas of, of research literature with a big evidence base behind them. Uh, and social and emotional learning, we know that we can build specific social and emotional skills and we can practice them, we can get better at them, and that can make a difference. And so we take that into this work. Um, and from trauma-focused CBT, from cognitive behavioral therapy, we know that we can cope with stress and trauma in a way that can help us grow and, and learn and cope and also thrive ultimately, even when we've experienced challenges, adversity, racism, oppression, discrimination, we can, we can use those experiences to heal um, and, and, and move forward and, and, and still uh, thrive. Um, and then in terms of racial socialization, there's a large literature on parenting and how parents can help their children understand what is racism, why does it exist, and how can I deal with it on a day-to-day -day basis? It's necessary for our black and brown children to do that, to have those conversations. And so uh, we do very little of that, though, in education systems. And there's really a lack of research on how that can be done more effectively in, in schools. And so we take that from the parenting literature and we build some of these practices that have been shown to work in schools and we brought those together. And that's how we came up with the, those different five actions that the talking, we, we first need language and terminology that involves some social emotional skills as well. Um, recognizing our, uh, when racism is occurring at different levels, so at interpersonal levels, but also systemic levels, that takes a lot of um, skill and, um, and also emotional regulation to be able to manage yourself and to be able to have that social awareness to see the perspective of others and how others are experiencing the world. Um, and then thinking about disrupting, we're, th we're thinking about kind of cognitive um, and behavioral strategies there about how can you reappraise a situation? How, you, how can you make sense of the situation? How can you kind of take it apart and decode a racialized encounter so that you um, can understand what your options are for how to act in that, in that moment? Um, and then in terms of coping, building those social emotional skills that support kind of emotion regulation, um, also some of that cognitive kind of work and, and reappraising a situation if necessary, but also building social support. So building your support network and your community so that you can kind of persist and, and keep going in this work. Um, and then in terms of healing and repairing harm, uh, that that is also where the racial socialization piece comes in, in terms of, of knowing how to make up for um, things that have happened that have been harmful, that perhaps there was... Um, you get called out for a microaggression that you kind of committed um, with um, with some students, and then you have to fix the situation, right? You have to repair that, and you have to make sure that everyone can kind of heal and move forward. And so how, the, there's a lot of social emotional skill kind of involved in being able to do that as well. Thank you for unpacking that. There's so much there. And as the mother of two African-American sons and the grandmother of two African-American girls, I really can relate to the parenting skills of teaching um, my sons about racialized situations and the, the even the link to our keynote this morning about being able to pause and reflect and not assuming um, from your observation what story is happening. And for, you know, as you said, students who are black and brown who may have been traumatized by racialized experiences being able to even learn those type of skills to, as you said, you know, kind of take a, a pause and, and look and, and appraise the situation and understand how they can respond and react and disrupt um, in those situations as well. Um, you, you mentioned um, the teachers and wanting to know more about how to engage in this dialogue, how to be more proactive in their behavioral responses in racialized situations. Tell me a little bit about what you found in your study about what the um, what supports do they need to better do that in their classrooms. It's a great question, and you know, as we know, the educator workforce is eighty percent white females, yes. um, and as a white female myself. A lot of times our, our upbringings, our socialization, our racial socialization is to avoid talking about race and racism. 
And so particularly we're finding that for white educators, there really is a need for a lot of support to, to unlearn some of what that socialization has been and to learn new uh, ways of, of talking about race and racism in ways that um, is, is absolutely going to be uncomfortable. So there's not there's a there's a real need to tolerate discomfort that that comes along, which is a huge uh, social emotional skill. Yes, yes, it is. Zumana, can you talk a little bit about your role in the research? Yeah, so I serve as the research coordinator. So I do a lot of like on ground work with like interviewing um, students and parents and caregivers, looking at the data, just doing a lot of like administrative work. Um, one big role that I did have this past few months was interviewing educators students and teachers for one of our projects um, just to understand their understanding of DEIB efforts, so diversity, inclusion, equity, and belonging efforts in schools and what can be improved when talking about racism in the school system. I'm going to ask both of you, what was the most surprising thing that you learned from this work? Zumana, would you start? I guess just based on like the work I've done the past few months was knowing that I mean, schools are doing a lot of things, but it may not be as effective as they perceive it to be when just talking with the educators and parents and whatnot. Um, it's like almost like a level of super, it's like superficial in a way where they don't feel like it actually goes into the root problem, the root issue. Um, so I feel like that was the most intriguing thing that I found. Um, and what about you? I guess a, a surprising finding is the is this is what I was thinking about the students? We're interviewing students, um, and and we've done some student focus groups about their perspectives on how their school currently um, is handling talking about racism. And the what's surprising to me is how insightful the students are. And we um, interviewed a few kindergartners. We interviewed some middle school students. You know, kids that. Um, some young, uh, some fifth graders were included. I mean, some, some kids that you might think are too young to have the language to be able to express like how schools could do a better job talking about racism. But they are interested, they are curious, they don't want you to sugarcoat it. They wanna know like, let's talk about racism. Let's talk about what it really means. Let's talk about how it's currently affecting us now. Yeah. And they, the difference between how students kind of approach the topic and educators, you know, where they haven't quite like, fully embraced that taboo topic element that that educators like are kind of all uh, kind of socialized to to kind of have so that the wisdom in, in students is is a big takeaway for me. Is there something that a student has said during those uh, interviews that particularly stands out for you? I remember one of the kindergartners saying like oh like MLK Jr. did this and then slave like slavery and racism is gone so but it's like oh no racism still exists today so it's like where is that like coming from like are we teaching students that like are we teaching racism from like a historical time point rather than like what's currently happening too right now and a lot of students like older ones do realize like racism still exists and they want to learn about how it's currently impacting the system and students now. So I think that was surprising to hear about that. Yeah, there is sort of this revisionist history that exists, or I won't even say revisionist so much as incomplete, mm -hmm. right? And not the narrative, not fully um, talking about the historical perspective in an accurate manner. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that, you know, I often share, um, you know, I do a lot of DEIB work, um, and one of the things that I often share with educators is something even as simple as this, the term slave, right? Mm -hmm. Slaves were brought over to America. Well, they weren't slaves. They were people who were enslaved once they came to the Americas. And so that even that perspective that, you know, folks who came from uh, Africa were really people and individuals, right? Not these uh, folks who didn't, weren't able to think for themselves and had to be, uh, you know, made, or were already slaves and, um, you know, not able to, um, again, be representative of the humanistic part of all of us, right? And, you know, I, when I was speaking with you earlier, in my own dissertation, finding out too that, 
the investment of a district in a equity program that was, you know, research based, evidence based, and implemented over a five year period, and finding that um, the teacher leaders still would say things like, I don't see color in my kids, which we know is important, right? That we, that teachers and educators recognize um, the individual um, identities of their students, whether they are white or Hispanic or African-American or Asian Pacific Islanders, like there's nothing wrong with recognizing that aspect of your student's identity. So in terms of uh, challenges and opportunities, what are you seeing as the most challenging things facing the K through 12 education system as it relates to implementing these five actions um, within these systems? I think there's, there's, there are many challenges. Um, and we know that there's so many folks that are practitioners that are, um, that are working on trying to make this change, right? To try to really impact racial equity in schools. And we've made very little progress really for all the really wonderful effort. And so I think that speaks to the just amount of barriers and the um, kind of inertia in the system to keep mm -hmm. things the way they are. Um, I do think a barrier we hear often coming up is, is time, pressure, accountability around test scores, the kind of things that um, we have also heard as barriers to, into, to in doing social emotional right. learning practices, right? right? And so um, what we've been talking about with equity leads throughout the state of Delaware is this idea that, it, that education systems provide materials in this one-off way. Mm -hmm. So no wonder it feels like an add-on. No wonder it feels like there's not mm -hmm. enough time because we don't treat it as one thing. We treat it as here's do equity, here's do SEL, here's do mental health, right. here's do this uh, new curriculum here. And But it's one child, it's one person, it's one teacher, it's one human. And so we, our brains don't actually work that way. Mm -hmm. So of course it feels like an add-on. So I think we need to kind of rethink how we're packaging all this stuff that we're expecting our school systems and our educators to do. And I do think equity needs to be at the forefront of that, that taking actions against racism needs to be part of that big picture, that holistic picture, but it can't be an add-on because then it, it, it won't happen. Yeah. It's interesting you mentioned that about the add-on. I just read a study where um, around teachers reporting that they felt that learning about other um, cultures' history was like a big gap. Like they didn't have that knowledge and expertise. And, you know, given our own cultural experience, um, learning about the dominant culture as the integral part of our educational experience, K through 12. And, you know, thinking about how teacher education programs um, could better prepare uh, teachers to learn about different cultures history as an experience that um, so that it does feel like a part of who they are and not this add on. So even thinking about how higher ed can play a role in better supporting um, student teachers in that in that kind of role. What about the opportunities that, that you learn that are available to um, teachers, education systems? I would say, I mean, uh, from a lot of these challenges does to me come some opportunity that there is a, a kind of a growing coalition, I would say, of folks who are willing and invested to try to make this impact that we're looking for in terms of um, kind of mental health, well-being, and, and, and kind of the overall holistic, uh, like, academic well-being of, of our black and brown children in our schools. And so it... Uh, Particularly in Delaware, where we've been really working, we've formed a professional learning community um, that just launched, um, and we call it the Actions Against Racism PLC, okay. uh, and that's a, a small part of what we see our kind of role in this work going forward, is bringing together like-minded folks to learn from each other, share successes, and there's tremendous opportunity there. We've found that there's so many silos of, of kind of people doing this work, mm -hmm. and that's that's 
going to keep things the same, right, if we're not learning from each other and kind of capitalizing on, on what uh, people are experiencing and, and what successes people are having. So I think that's a real opportunity. And we'll be, uh, we do have a website uh, that will kind of highlight some of the findings from, from that work and from our, from our intervention work as well. Great. I think that learning is um, so important and being able to hear other people's perspectives and, and within our own organization, you know, we've been focusing on belonging and building a culture of belonging. And I think what has really resonated with folks is that even, you know, if you are of the dominant race, but you identify, you know, we have many um, other intersections for our, our identity. I'm also black and a woman, um, you know, I'm a mother. So all of these intersecting identities and really that feeling of belonging from knowing that, that those intersecting identities really matter. And for our students, um, I think that is the most critical thing to know that they, they're seen and heard um, by their teachers for who they are um, and for all that they are, right? And um, one of the things that I think is important is as educators, for, for folks that don't, nobody's looking for perfection, right? Right, this is a learning process for all of us. And so I really applaud the fact that you're doing these professional learning communities because it does provide people with that opportunity to learn from each other and hear those different perspectives, which can really be um, thought changing in terms of, you know, not understanding where somebody who is, uh, you know, maybe of Asian Pacific Islander descent and how they experience, you know, um, the education system as it, as it stands today. So I want to thank both of you for your time today. I wish you, um, I'm sure you're going to do well in your workshop. And I um, really um, am here to say thank you for your research and um, your findings and making sure people are aware of what they can do to um, be better humans, right? In this time uh, of the world where we're you know, hearing lots of uh, kind of uh, counter indications about what is right and what is wrong, that what we're really saying is, you know, at the at core of who we all are is human. And if we can respect each other for that, that's a great beginning for the rest of the conversation. So thank you again for being here today and I wish you well. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.